But yes, Lord, there is so much going on, and we pray that you would continue to give us a heart to reach out to our community, to spread your gospel, to build your kingdom. God, it's all about you. God, it's, it's, it's not about us. Father, I pray that as we continue our series on the Sermon on the Mount, Lord, you would give us the wisdom that we need, the wisdom to know how you want us to live, what you want us to do, not out of obligation or legalism, but out of a heart of necessity, a desire to worship you, out of a desire for relationship with you. Father, I pray that your word would resonate in our hearts and your Holy Spirit would come and convict us. We love you. We thank you. And in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. So when I was, when I was younger, uh, I grew up in the church, and the church had a lot of rules. That was kind of what the church was. It was just a place of a lot of rules. One of the rules that was made very apparent and very clear was that we were not allowed to read Harry Potter. Harry Potter was off limits. It was one of those books that everyone was reading. Everyone, uh, every, the movies hadn't come out yet. Everyone was reading the books, and everyone was going this. And I remember, you know, a lot of the parents were, like, very concerned. They were like, this book is about witches. It's about wizards. It's about all these different things. And, and, and we got to keep our kids away from it. And I remember... I think I was in middle school, and it was like, they can't tell me what to read. They can't tell me this. And so there was a group of us at church that we got the books, and we would even bring them to church. And we would hide them, and we would read these, these Harry Potter books. And again, I'm not saying if it's right or wrong. It was probably bad that we were so rebellious. And so um, we were bad kids. We were reading. Like, what, what the heck? But anyways, we're reading these books. And in, 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 in these books, it was, it was very interesting. It was very fascinating because it's about these kids. And if you've never heard about Harry Potter, um, you need to, like, move out of that rock and, and come into the real world. But Harry Potter, it was a book about, you know, these wizards and witches. And, and basically, um, they go to school. And, and we found it so interesting because it's these wizards and witches that go to schools. And, and they're learning how to say these spells. And, and as they're, they're saying these spells, sometimes they say it wrong because they're in Latin or they're in these weird languages, and it backfires, and it blows up in their faces. And so you'll, you'll, you'll hear them say, say these spells, and, and it'll, it'll just ruin everything. And I remember we were thinking, like, that's so cool. Like, I wish my school was like that. I wish, I wish oh, like, at our school we could, we could say these and, and say it the perfect way so that it, it produces the correct result. You, you, you will say this incantation, you'll say this spell, and, and magic will happen. And I, I remember thinking... As, as a young kid, I was like, isn't that kind of like prayer? Like, the way that I, I, I thought about prayer was, was very similar. Like, if I don't say exactly the right words, if I don't say it with the, ex, like the, the, the best kind of attitude or, or the best kind of posture, if I'm not using the correct vocabulary, if I'm using disrespectful language, then, then it's not going to work. And so when, when you pray, especially when you pray in front of other people, you need to make sure that you're prim and you're proper and you're doing everything correctly or God is going to say, nope, your prayer is not good enough. And I remember thinking that. I remember growing up and, and that being kind of the way I approached prayer was God's not going to receive a prayer that is said poorly. He's not going to receive a prayer that is bad. And, and you know what? The crazy thing is sometimes you'll say a prayer perfectly and it still won't come true. It still won't happen the way that you want to. And I remember this one pastor came and spoke to our youth group, and he basically said, kids, you need to pray for humility, but be careful. Because when you pray for humility, God may humiliate you. And I'm like, oh, no. Like, this is another one of those situations that make prayer so confusing. Like, of course I want to be humble. Of course I want, like, God, I want to be humble, but I don't want to be humiliated. I don't want to have this situation where I'm praying, God, please give me humility. Give me humility. Give me this, 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 this godliness about me. And then God say, okay, you prayed for that, and you prayed it in, a, in a, an interesting way. So here, here's a, a dose of humble pie. I didn't want that. And so again, I kind of grew up thinking, okay, the way that I need to pray is I need to be very careful with the words I use, making sure that I say it in the best way possible, you know, if, if I could even learn Korean and, and say my prayers in Korean, then even more. It's even better because if you, if you pray in a different language, then, then God is really going to, he's really going to hear your prayers. And then as I got older, I began to think, you know what? God knows. He knows everything. So why even bother praying at all? So why even mess with that? Why even mess with this kind of talk uh, uh, to God saying, God, I want this. I need this. God, help me here. Help me with this. You know, God already knows. He already knows everything that's going on. So what's, 
the point in praying. See, today's sermon is called How to Pray. And, and you know what? Even as I titled it that, I, I was getting nervous and I was getting worried. Like, oh my goodness, how am I going to tell people how they should be praying? Like, what, what, is, what, what, what do I have to say about it? But the reason why I tell this is not because of something that I have to say, but what Jesus has to say. So would you open up your Bibles with me to Matthew chapter 6. And we're going to start reading from verse 8. But a few weeks ago, we talked about these hypocrites, these people who would go and they would pray on the street corners. They would pray these long and lengthy prayers that sounded eloquent, that sounded wonderful, and they would say it at the top of their lungs so everyone could hear them, everyone could see them and know that they are holy, that they are good people because their prayers were strong and powerful. And Jesus then explains, he says, no, pray in your closet. Pray in, pray in the secret place because God who is in secret will respond and answer your prayer. And that those people who are on the street corner, that they've already gotten their reward. That God wants to reward you in secret. And so starting from verse 8 in chapter 6, we, we, we continue Jesus' sermon. It says, do not be like them, these hypocrites, for your Father knows what you need before you ask him. And we're going to stop there for a second. And we can just even leave it there on, on the screen. And, and this, it's this idea of you don't need to be like the people that have these super intricate and eloquent prayers who are saying it at the top of their lungs and they're using all of the theatrics of prayer because then God will hear your prayers. Jesus is saying, no, God already knows. You don't need to be like these people who are screaming at the top of their lungs, who are reciting these incantations and, and, and doing these rain dances and doing all these things, that God, he already sees you. He knows what you need. And again, this is where that argument comes. Well, God already knows, so why bother praying? See, God already knows everything that I need, so what's the point in praying? Jesus' response to this isn't, oh yeah, you're right. God knows, so don't pray. No, Jesus' response to this, saying that God knows everything. He knows all. He is omniscient. He knows everything, that's, every possible scenario. He already is there, so why do we pray? So we continue. It says, pray then like this. It's a command. Pray then like this. Our Father in heaven, hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our debts as we have also forgiven our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For if you forgive others their trespasses, your heavenly Father will also forgive you. But if you do not forgive others their trespasses, neither will your Father forgive your trespasses. The way that Jesus begins this and the way that we approach prayer is very simple. It's, it's, it's very simple. And the way it begins is, is, hopefully you've heard it before, the Lord's Prayer. It's our Father in heaven, hallowed be your name. This idea that what we're saying to God in this prayer, the way Jesus is modeling prayer for us is not rocket science. This prayer takes maybe 15 seconds to say. I think, I mean, Emery can say it in about five. But we can say it really quickly. But the idea is it's very simple. The first point in this prayer is, is that, God, you have authority. God, you have the authority, not me. Your will be done. Your kingdom come. Hallowed be your name. The whole purpose of this prayer in the beginning is to set us in the right context as we approach God. And, and the image that I want to give you is that whenever we pray, and this is any time you pray, I don't care if it's right before a meal, I don't care if it's because you need something really urgent, like right away, I don't care if it's, it's because you're praying just a random prayer, even for church on Sunday. It, it always should begin, not with these words, but it always should begin with this posture, this this idea that God is in the seat of authority. The image that I want to create for you is that God is sitting on the throne. He is sitting on a throne like a king. And, and, and like a king, he has all the authority and the power of his kingdom. And his kingdom is his creation, the universe. And so again, we're approaching the king. We're approaching God. And, and what we do is what we're stating is we're saying, God, you have the authority. You have all the power. It's all about you. We want your kingdom to come. We want your will be done. Your will to be done, not ours. 
And, and it's so vital, it's so key that we had this understanding of what authority is in this, in this way we pray. Because many times the way we approach prayer is the exact opposite. Is that we're the ones who are sitting in the throne, and when we pray, God is like our servant. And we say, God, I need a new job. So go and fetch me a new job. And again, we're not saying it that disrespectfully, but many times that's how we pray. God, my child is sick, so go. Go heal her. Go heal them. Because you know what? You need to. And many times what ends up happening is because we lack this respect. We lack this understanding that God is the one in the seat of authority rather than us. We begin to look at God like a bad servant. See, when we're in the seat of authority, when we're the ones sitting on the throne, and and we're saying, okay, God, you know, I need a new house. You know, God, I, I would really like a promotion. God, I would really like some job security. I would really like my, my kids to get into the right college. I would really like for these things to happen. And again, when we're sitting on the seat of authority and God is our servant and we're saying, hey, I'm praying to you every single day, would you please heal my brother? Would you please, would you please make their life better? And, and, and we, we begin to think, because God doesn't answer the way we want him to answer, we're like, man, God's a bad servant. God's like that kind of worker that, that it will take a lot of breaks. And, and when we say, hey, God, can you help me out here? He'll say, well, I'm on my lunch break. I'll, I'll help you when I get back. And, and, and a lot of times it's like we're praying for something so long and so, and we become so frustrated because we're like, I just need, I just need this little thing. Can you please do this little thing, God? And we look at God and, and God says, can you be patient? Can you please just wait? And again, this is the, the issue when we come to prayer and if we're sitting in the seat of authority. If we're the one sitting on the throne and we're the one who are spouting out orders to God, then all of a sudden the way we paint God is, is that he is capricious. He is fickle. He is lazy. And some of, for some of you, that's how you view your prayer life. You become very frustrated with prayer because God's not doing things on your timeline. But the way it's supposed to work is that God's the one that's on the throne. And that as his servants, if anything more, not only as his servants, but as his children, we approach God with the respect that he deserves. That he's sitting on the throne, and like a servant, we go to God and we say, my master, my Lord. And we keep our head down low, and we kneel before his feet, and we say, these are my problems. These are my issues. You are king. You are wise. You are worthy. You are loving. You are kind. You are caring. Would you please, would you please bless your servant? Totally different attitudes. One is saying, hallowed be your name. One is saying, one is saying, God, you are the one who is sitting on the throne. You are deserving of everything. You are the creator of the universe. You are majestic. You are beautiful. You are wonderful. You are loving. And so please help me. And the other is saying, I'm, I'm the one who's in charge. God, you need to help me. You need to answer my prayers. Come on, be quicker. Answer it on my timeline. Do what I say. I need this right now. Which leads into the second point. See, Jesus isn't saying the way you pray is only by giving God all the glory. The way you pray is by, is by reciting how good God is. And that's the only way your prayer needs to be. Like, the, the many times, that's how I thought prayer was supposed to be. Prayer is, is not supposed to be for you asking things from God. It's simply just you saying, God, you're so good, you're so good, I trust in you. You do what you need to do, and I'll just wait. Jesus makes it clear. He says, give us this day our daily bread. And, and this is where a lot of people have, have said, okay, you know, daily bread is just bread. It's just food. But what I, the way I interpret what daily bread is, is it's the things that you need to live. The things you need to survive. And not only to survive, but the things you need to, to thrive. To, to make life bearable. To make life not only bearable and tolerable, but to make life comfortable. And, and I think this is where a lot of people get lost. In the church, and, and there, there, there's factions that form. They're like, so are, do we pray for prosperity? And, and my answer is this. Yes, we pray for prosperity. Yes, we pray for good things. We pray for the things that we need. But the reason why we're not preaching the prosperity gospel, where that's the only thing you preach, is because we understand who the giver of these things are. 
and it's God, our Father. See, God being our Father is such an important aspect of this prayer. The reason why it begins by saying our Father, and, and, and how radical that is for the time, is to say that God is your Father is not something that is culturally sensitive to this time. Because saying that God is your Father, your Dad, has a lot of implications. You see, a father wants to give their children good gifts. Any father wants to give their kids good gifts. And I think what Jesus is trying to teach his disciples is this God that you're worshiping, you're serving, he's not this mean, angry God who just wants to punish you for all the bad things you do, but he does want to bless you. He does want to give you good things. So ask him for your daily bread. You know, you need something? Ask him. My little sister, and again, it's kind of different because I'm the middle. So I have an older sister, and um, it's me, and then I have a little sister. My little sister's really good at asking my parents for things. And, and it's, it's nothing against her. She just really, she's, she's the youngest. And so I remember, it's like, for me, I, I grew up thinking, okay, I have to work for everything. I mean, I, I got a job when I was in high school, and it was like, okay, if I want something, I'm not going to ask my dad. I'm going to just work for it and then buy it, and then, you know, it's mine. Jamie, my little sister, she would, she would go, Dad, could I? can I please have this? I really need it. I, I, I really need it. And my dad would go, oh, you need it? Here. And here's another. And so she would end up with two. And she would be like, oh, thanks, dad. And she would walk away. And I, I, I would go to her. I was like, how can you, like, how, what, 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 how, what did you say? Like, what, what did you do? And she goes, dad loves giving me stuff. He, 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 loves, he loves to give me things. And so I just ask. I just ask. I'm like, that's not fair. That's so not fair because if I ask, like, he's going to say no. And, and, and Jamie says something very wise. She goes, but did you ask? And I go, no. She goes, like, and she basically just looks at me and she says, she says, well, there's your answer. Of course, if you don't ask, then it's going to be a no. I, I think what ends up happening is this. Many times we feel very guilty. I grew up, we grew up in um, a Korean church, and what ends up happening is, if you have nice things, the, the church culture was basically to hide it or, or to, to just kind of feel a little guilty. Like if you had something really nice, you feel guilty because you're like, oh, man, there's others that don't have this. And I, I don't know. I don't know about you, but, like, that kind of impacted the way I viewed, I viewed possessions. And it was like if anyone had nice things, it would be like, man, they should feel really bad that they have nice things. I think when it comes to the way that Jesus explains, he, he begins by by modeling prayer by, by realizing that God's the one who's sitting in authority. But he leads us to the second point, which is to ask. Give us this day our daily bread. The next line is even, is even more radical. If you think daily bread is radical, the next line is even more radical. Forgive us our debts. That is a way more radical ask than simply just saying, Lord, can you give me my daily bread, the things that I need? It's now saying, Lord, will you forgive my debts? Will you forgive the money I owe? Will you forgive the debts I have in the world? And again, God being a good father, we understand he does forgive our debts. So we do need to ask. And I think there needs to be a boldness behind the ask. Because we understand the authority of God. So again, it's the same image. God sitting on the throne. We recognize first and foremost when we pray, we say, Lord, you are Lord. You are King. You are majestic. You are perfect. You are good. But I ask you this. I plead you this. Please, help me. Give me what I need. Give me what I need to stand strong, to survive. I, I need this. And I think a lot of us are stuck. We're, we're stuck because we, we're, we're not, we don't have the boldness to even ask, I need help from God. We're so prideful. We're so, we're so frustrated with the situation that we, we come to church and we say, God, you're a good God. You're wonderful. I'll sing you these songs of praise. But my life is so burdensome. And we just walk out. And then the cycle continues. Next Sunday comes. God, you're wonderful. You are good. I worship you forever. My life is so burdensome. We just walk out. Jesus is trying to explain to us here. 
Yes, it's great you're saying, God, you're good, you're wonderful, you're amazing, you're all powerful, but just ask. Just say, Lord, my life is so burdensome. I need your strength. I need your power. Because God wants to show you his power. And it's a cycle, too. This is the best part, is that when you, when you recognize his authority and then you ask him for things, he'll answer it. But what happens is you begin to recognize his authority even more because you recognize all these good things that are happening to you. It's not because you work so hard. It's not because you built it up because you're so smart. It's because God is the one who gave it to you. He's the one who's been blessing you. So the cycle of thanksgiving just continues. The problem is, is again, we're not allowing God to sit in that seat of authority. We're sitting in it. And so when good things happen, when we are given our daily bread, when the daily bread comes about, what we do is this. Yeah, I made it. Yeah, I'm the one who brought home the bacon. I'm the one who has this good salary, so give us this day our daily bread. Yeah, you're asking me. I'm the one who's sitting on the throne. Forgive us our debts. Yeah, I'm the one who pays your college tuition. So you know what? It's me. So there's a third part. Third part to the Lord's Prayer. And, it's, and, and forgive us our debts as we have also forgiven our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For if you forgive others their trespasses, your heavenly Father will also forgive you. But if you do not forgive others their trespasses, neither will your, forgo- for your Father forgive your trespasses. See, it's this idea that we have to apply. We have to apply what God has done for us. See, this idea of asking God to forgive our debts and how it immediately follows is that as we have forgiven our debtors, it leads me to think of this parable that Jesus talked about. And it was, it's the parable of the unforgiving servant. What ends up happening in this, and I hope to preach on this story one day because it's one of my favorites, and I think it applies to our culture in so many ways. This one servant of the king, of a king, owed the king millions of dollars. And, and to calculate it in our terms, it doesn't really work out too well, but think of like $25 million. He owed the king $25 million. Probably a business went bad or something went south and, and the money he borrowed to, to do something great and wonderful just failed. And the king has all the right in the world to put him in jail or even to kill him because he lost that much money. But the king, being gracious and being kind, looks at that servant and says, your debts are forgiven. And man, if you could... Imagine being that servant that owed the king $25 million walking out of the courtroom, walking out of the throne room, the royal royal procession, and he would just be like, oh, man, I'm so free. I'm so alive. Then he has one of his buddies come to him and say, hey, man, you you gave me $500, um, you know, a couple months ago, but, man, I can't pay it back. I mean, I know $500 is a lot of money, and I know it's, it's really tough, but, shoot, man, like, things are really, really Things are really bad. The, the servant who was forgiven $25 million talks to his friend that owed him five hundred and says, you know what, man? That's just not right. That's not cool. I'm going to take you to court. And you know what? The court's going to find you guilty, and I'm just going to throw you in jail. The king finds out about this servant. He finds him, and he says, what are you doing? What's going on? You owed me so much, and I forgave you it all. And this guy owed you $500? And you threw him in jail? And so the right thing that the king did was he put the guy that owed him $25 million and put him in jail. And I, I think this goes really well with the way prayer needs to work. See, we ask for all these things, and it's good that we ask. It's, it's very good that we ask God to, to give us our daily bread, to give us what we need. But there comes even a third aspect, which is then we need to go out and we need to apply what God has done to us. See, it's all a cycle. It all, it all works together. Is that when we receive from God, we can look at God and say, it's all your credit. It's all because of you that I received this. And when we give, when we're the ones on the giving end, when we're the ones who are able to forgive others' debts, to forgive their trespasses, to, to forgive others, what we do is, again, we learn how good our God is because of how much he's forgiven us. If we're missing even one aspect of this, we don't understand the full gospel. 
we don't understand what Jesus did on the cross for us. See, some of us are in, in this mode where all we're doing is receiving from God. We're only in that time where we're just harvesting. We're just having blessing after blessing after blessing. And we're really good about saying, thank you, God. Thank you, God. Thank you, God. And, and we're on that spiritual high. You know, we're, we're on that high where we're like, oh, man, I'm being so blessed. I'm, I'm, I'm getting poured into. My life is so good. There's, a, there's this third aspect to it. So now, because you've been receiving, now you need to give. You need to apply what you've what you've been receiving, you need to apply it to those around you. To put it very simply, and I, I literally just thought about this, to pray is just, if you, if you want to figure out how to pray, if you're in a real tight bind or you just want to pr- learn how to develop your prayer life, just call AAA. The authority of God, the ask, and the apply. If you, if, you follow, if you follow these three A's, and I'm really bad with even these, these kind of points, but it makes it very simple. And what I realize is this, is that when we recognize the authority of God, when we begin to ask everything that we need, and we begin to apply it back onto the people around us, what ends up happening is that prayer will naturally transform you into, in, into a Christ-like person. And I, I truly believe that without prayer, without this kind of prayer, without praying the Lord's Prayer, not as a prayer of just recitation, of just memorization, just saying the words without any meaning, by praying this prayer, by recognizing that God is the one who's in authority, I need to ask him for the things that I need, and I need to apply what he's taught me. What, I, what you will naturally see in your life is a progression that you will be more like Jesus Christ. See, when we see Jesus pray, and, we, and one of his most intense prayers is in the Garden of Gethsemane before he's, he's put on the cross. Is that Jesus does this exact thing. Is that he first recognizes God's authority. He recognizes that his father is good, his father is perfect. And mind you, this is all while Jesus is God. He is, he is the Savior of the world. He is the second person of the Trinity. He recognizes how good God the Father is. He recognizes how good it's his will to be done, not his own. And then it comes to the ask. And Jesus models this for us very well. He says, would you take this cup, this cup, this cup of suffering, would you take it away from me? See, many times we kind of gloss over the fact Jesus even asked if God was willing to take away the burden of the cross from him. But the way Jesus ends it is through application. He says, but not my will, but your will be done. And his application is this, is that he was willing to die for us. He was willing to be tortured for us. He was willing to give even when he had nothing to give. He was willing to give everything that he had because he understood. Because he understood that it wasn't about his will, but it was all about the Father's will. So this is not even a call to memorize the Lord's Prayer. This is not a call to... to recite the correct incantations. We're not here to to say spells. I don't think any prayer, the words of any prayer are wrong. I think it all has to do with the heart. When you pray, I want you to think of that throne. I want you to think of God sitting on that throne and to recognize that he is not only your king, but he's also your father. And so as you approach him, would you treat him with that respect? This is the king of the entire universe, the king of all creation, the king who is able to do anything he chooses, the king that made the heavens and the earth, that is the one that causes the earth to spin and the sun to stay in place. That we would go before him with our head down low, with our knees on the ground. We would ask, Lord, would you please give me what I need? Not on my, my, not on my terms, not because I say so, but because you're a good father. Would you please answer my prayer? And as we ask, would we also apply? Would, be, would, we, would we be generous? Would we be the ones that with the people around us, that when there is a need that arises, that we would not be hard of hearts and say, you don't deserve it. But instead we would say, I'm not doing this because you deserve it. I'm doing this because I love you. What ends up happening is this. 
when we begin to approach others and apply it to others, saying, I'm not doing this because you deserve it. I'm doing it because I love you. I care about you. We begin to understand God's heart in an even deeper way. As, as a, a young father, I, I realize my goal is to make sure my children aren't spoiled. I, I really don't want my children to be spoiled. I, I don't want them to feel entitled. As a millennial, everyone says my generation is very entitled, that we go into situations feeling like everything is deserving unto us and that we deserve this, deserve that. And again, this is exactly what God is trying to combat in us as Christians. I think many times when people go to pray, we feel very entitled. We're very spoiled. The idea is this. Would you pray? Would you pray in a manner, in a posture that follows the Lord's prayer? Would we recognize he's sitting on the throne? You're not there. You don't belong on the throne. That when we go to him, that he's the God that can answer your prayers. So I give you permission. If you have a, a family member who's sick, if you have someone who's in need, if you, have, if, if you have any issues or any problems, go before God and ask him. Ask him boldly. Ask him with that conviction and the power. But don't ask him demanding. Ask him as his child. And as you ask him, would you also have the heart to help those around you? The reason why I, I, I even enjoy this, it's, it's not a call just to individuals. It's a call to our community. See, if we find out that someone is sick in our church, we don't just say, okay, you need to pray on your own. Go to God, and, and God will hear your prayer because you're, you're his loving child. What we do is we all go together. We all come together before our king in one voice, in one voice together of worship, that our church it's not about a prayer meeting. It's not, it's not about a worship meeting. It's that our church would come together and we would all bow down before our king and say, God, you are holy, you are worthy, you are perfect, but we ask that you would heal our brother, you would heal our sister, that you would hear our plead, you would hear our cry, and you would start to transform in us a desire to help those around us. That as you answer our prayers, that we'd be even more bold in showing our love to this world. It's interesting. This, this prayer is recited so much in churches all across the world. But I think it's when we really follow it, that's when the world will see prayer is powerful. Not because you're powerful, but because God's powerful. Let's pray. Our Father, you're in heaven. You, you reside in heaven. God, hallowed be your name. God, you are so holy. You are so good. You are perfect. You are all powerful. God, your kingdom come, not ours. God, your will be done. Let what you want to happen be made manifest here on this earth. God, I pray that you would give us this day our daily bread. God, I pray for every person in here that whatever their needs are, whatever their desires are, Lord, you begin to show them that you are a good Father that has good gifts for us. Father, I pray that you would forgive us our debts. God, you would relieve us of all that burden of this life. Would you free us of feeling as if we are in the red, but would you bring us back to a place where we are given just that ability to breathe, but God, also give us the power to forgive our debtors. God, I pray that you would not lead us into temptations or contexts that are going to lead us away from your love, but instead you would deliver us from evil. Would you allow us to be firm and strong in the truth in knowing that Jesus is the one who came to save us? God, for yours is the kingdom, the power, and the glory forever and ever. I was just thinking how awkward it is many times still for me to ask God for things, to ask God for my daily bread. But I, I recognize, you know, whatever it is you're asking for, the call also is that you would be willing to give it as well. And an idea came in my head, which was, if I asked God for a car, you know, a brand new car, and I had the, the boldness to say, God, I, 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 please, please, I need this car, would I have the same heart? to give that car away to someone else. 
And I realize this is really a call not just to receive, but a call to give. Our God is so good, and he wants us to experience life to the fullest. And I realize many of us, we need to learn both the joy of receiving and the joy of giving. Would you pray with me? Father, you are so good. You're so good to us. You're so loving that while we were still sinners and not deserving of the things that you have given us, yet you still gave, yet you still love. Father, I ask for our church that you would create a community. Lord, would you create a family that loves one another, that cares for one another, that provides for one another. Father, that we would not be selfish, but God, that in all things that we would give you the credit, honor, and glory. Father, give us the things that we need. Father, right now our church is praying for a building. Would you please provide us one so that we could worship you? And Father, would you allow us to bless the community around us? God, that our church would forgive our debts as we forgive our debtors. God, that you would be able to just work through us in a way that is powerful. Continue to watch over us. Be with us. Would you make the gospel real to us? And now may the Lord bless you and keep you. May the Lord make his face to shine upon you and be gracious to you. May the Lord lift up his countenance upon you and give you peace. In the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen. You are dismissed. Thank you.